Welcome to another tutorial video. This one is going to be a crash course on convertible bonds. Since it is a crash course, I'm not going to go through every topic in detail, but I will spend at least a few minutes on the key points when it comes to accounting, valuation, how to calculate the cost of convertible bonds in the WAC calculation and more. So we get a lot of questions about convertible bonds, which are just bonds that can convert into common shares if the company's share price rises to a high enough level. For example, maybe it has to go to 30% or 50% over its current price. And then at that level, the convertible bond holders can convert their bonds into shares if they want to. So it is a right, but not an obligation to convert the bonds into shares. It can be a confusing topic, and I think a lot of the existing coverage about convertible bonds actually makes it more confusing. So we're going to clarify some of the most important points here. The most important point is that to analyze a convertible bond, you need to split it into its debt and equity components. And you have to do this to value a bond, to estimate its cost for use in the WAC formula for calculating the discount rate, and even when you are calculating some of the key metrics and ratios involving the bond. The other important point here is that unlike what a lot of people claim, convertible bonds are not, in fact, cheap debt. They're actually more expensive than traditional debt, even though their interest rates, their cash expense is lower. But before we get into all of this, let's start with some of the fundamentals and then we'll progress through these topics. Our plan for this lesson is as follows. I will list the timestamps for each of these on screen since this is a longer video. I'm going to start by telling you about the typical terms and the conversion options associated with convertible bonds. Then we will cover which types of companies issue convertible bonds most often. Then we'll look at convertible bonds on the financial statements, how they get recorded and how they change over time. Then we will go through convertible bond valuation and I'll show you the basic idea behind valuing the equity component of a convertible bond. We'll look at payoff diagrams and payback periods and what these can tell you about a bond's market price or market value. And then we'll conclude by looking at the blended cost of convertible bonds and how the cost is typically in between the cost of debt and the cost of equity. Let's get started with the typical terms and conversion options. So the coupon rate attached to a convertible bond is just how much the company pays in interest on this bond on an annual basis. This is much lower than it is for normal bonds because convertible bonds have the conversion option, which adds a lot of value. So if a normal bond has a coupon rate of four or 5%, a convertible bond might have a coupon rate of 0% or 0.5% or 1% or something like that. Then there's the maturity, which means when the company has to repay the bond in full in the future. This tends to be shorter than it is for normal bonds. So if a normal bond has a maturity of 10 years, a convertible bond might be five years or seven years or something in that range. The conversion price tells you the level that the company's stock price has to reach for the bondholders to be able to convert their bonds into common shares. This is usually a premium to the current share price, something like 30%, 40%, 50%, something in that range usually. The par value is how much an individual bond in a convertible bond issuance is worth. $1,000 here is the standard assumption, at least for US-based companies. Then there's the conversion ratio, which tells you how many common shares each bond converts into. This is the par value, usually $1,000 divided by the conversion price. The number of convertible bonds is how many individual bonds are in the issuance. This is the face value of the issuance divided by the par value. And then the potential diluted shares from, from the convertible bond is the number of convertible bonds times the conversion ratio. This is a lot of words. Let's go into Excel and see what this looks like so you can understand the dynamics here. So I have on screen this example of a company with a share price of $200. They're going to issue $5 billion of convertible bonds. The coupon rate will be 0.5%. Now, if they issued this as a traditional bond, they would be paying more like 4% according to this. And it is a six year maturity. So it matures on December 31st of 2028. The conversion price here, this is a pretty high premium. It's around a 50% premium to the company's current share price of $200 and the par value is just the $1,000 default value. So the conversion ratio here is going to be the par value divided by the conversion price. And then the number of convertible bonds will just be the face value or the bond principle of the $5 billion here divided by the par value. 
This tells us that this issuance has a total of around 5 million convertible bonds, individual bonds in it. And then to figure out how many shares these could potentially convert into, we take the conversion ratio and we multiply by this number. And we can see that potentially this company could end up with between 16 and 17 million dilutive shares, which adds to its diluted share count pretty significantly. It would go up from 400 million to about 417 million with this in place. So these are the basic parameters for a convertible bond. Let's move to the second part and talk about the types of companies that tend to issue convertible bonds. Convertible bonds are the most common for high growth, high risk companies like technology companies in growth mode, tech startups, biotech startups, firms like that. This is because convertible bonds have very low coupon rates, often 0%. And so they are much more like hedged equity than they are like traditional fixed income from the point of view of investors. If the company performs well and its stock price soars, maybe it doubles or triples or goes up by a huge percentage, then the investors can convert their bonds into common shares and capture that upside. But if the company's stock price crashes, maybe its products don't work out, maybe it fails to get approval for its drugs for a biotech startup, the investors can at least get their money back when the convertible bond matures. And you can see this pretty well in the Excel example here. Because let's say that the company's share price performs very well. Let's say it doubles and goes up to $400 per share. In this case, we could look at the potential diluter shares multiplied by the share price and see that the investors could take a $5 billion issuance and potentially get more like $6.7 billion out of it if the share price performs really well. Now, if the opposite happens, so let's say that the share price plummets and goes down to $50 per share. In this case, it would be disastrous for the common shareholders, but the convertible bond holders do not face any problems because they are still going to get back their $5 billion when the company repays or refinances this in the future. So they're not going to lose everything in this case if the share price plummets. Instead, the worst that will happen, at least if the company stays solvent, is that they will get back their $5 billion issuance here upon maturity. One myth is that convertible bonds are cheaper than traditional bonds, so they're appropriate for a company that might have trouble servicing its debt or paying for its interest. The truth is that the cash cost is lower, which can be helpful for startups and high growth companies that have irregular or inconsistent cash flows. But the actual all in cost of convertible bonds is higher. It is in between the cost of debt and the cost of equity in most cases. And to illustrate why, I'm going to give you a simple example that shows why you can't just look at the coupon rate or the yield on a convertible bond to determine its cost. Let's say we have a company with a cost of debt of 5% based on the yields of similar bonds in the industry. And then its stock has a dividend yield of 3%. So if you buy a share, you get about 3% of that each year in dividends. If you buy one of the company's bonds, you earn 5% annualized on average over time. In this case, you might think that the equity is cheaper than the debt because the dividend yield is lower. But if you really think about this and you ask this question, would investors expect to earn more on the debt just because the cost of debt is higher than the dividend yield here? The answer is a clear no, because the market value of the equity, its shares could change over time. So the cost is much higher than the cost of debt. If you add in the potential stock price appreciation here, the cost of equity is probably going to be closer to maybe 10%, 8%, 11%, something in that range, depending on the company and industry. So yes, the yield is lower. The cash cost of shares is lower than the cash cost of debt, but that doesn't actually mean that the cost of equity is lower than the cost of debt. Because when you calculate the cost, it is the cash yield plus the potential price appreciation. And the same is true for convertible bonds. So yes, the cash cost is lower, but when you take into account the fact that these convertibles could turn into shares, the cost actually ends up being higher than the 4% that the company would be paying on traditional debt here. And you'll see this as we go through the rest of this exercise. Let's now go to the financial statement treatment and some of the accounting here. So the two main options with convertible bonds are to record the bond as a single liability or to split it into liability and equity components on the statements. Under US GAAP, the single liability treatment is far more common as of 2022. It has varied in the past, and sometimes it's been more like a 50-50 mix between these two treatments. But as of right now, 
the single liability treatment is more common because of some accounting rule changes. Under IFRS, for non-US companies, the liability and equity split treatment is more common. Now, under both methods, you record the face value of the convertible bond minus the issuance fees on the balance sheet. So that always shows up in some form. But the difference is that with the split treatment, you have to calculate the value of the convertible bond as if it were a traditional bond and use that for the liability component. And then you put the remainder, the face value minus this liability component into equity instead. And then you have to amortize this bond discount and include it with the cash interest in interest expense on the income statement and then add it back as a non-cash adjustment on the cash flow statement. So let's go into Excel and take a quick look at this. We'll start with the US GAAP treatment right here. So the face value of the convertible bond is just the $5 billion right here. And then we deduct the issuance fee. So the 5 billion times the 1% here. And so we record a little bit less than 5 billion on the balance sheet because of these issuance fees that are paid in cash and then amortized over time. Now the book value of the equity component here is zero because under this single liability treatment common for US GAAP, there is no equity component. The annual cash interest expense is going to be just the bond principal, the 5 billion here times the fixed coupon rate of 0.5%. And then we will also amortize these issuance fees over the term of the convertible bond. So we take the 50 million in issuance fees, we divide by the six year maturity. And so we get about 8 million per year in the issuance fee amortization. I'm also gonna change this formula up here for consistent signs. There will be no amortization of the bond discount with this treatment, and so we can add up everything. We get 33 million per year in interest expense, and then for the non-cash adjustments, the only thing here is the amortization of the issuance fees. So you'll see this as an add back on the cash flow statement, but you will not see anything else there, and the interest expense here is relatively low and closely linked to the fixed coupon rate of 0.5%. With the IFRS treatment, we have to use the price function in Excel. And we will enter the settlement date right up here. I'm just using today's date for this. We need the maturity right here. So the convertible bond maturity, December 31st, 2028. And then we need to enter the coupon rate, the 0.5%. For the yield, this is the discount rate on the convertible bond. This is just the equivalent rate on non-convertible debt. So the 4% right here. For the redemption, we'll just say 100 and assume there is no default risk. And then for the frequency, we'll use the two for the two coupons per year. And then for the basis, we can just use a 360 day year, although it doesn't really matter either way. We will divide all this by 100 because if we just use the price function as is, we get sort of weird output. It gives us something out of 100, but it doesn't frame it as a percentage. So we'll divide this by 100 to get this in percentage format and then we'll multiply by the 5 billion here to get this as a number out of the 5 billion face value. So the value as a traditional bond here is only about 4 billion because of the large difference between the fixed coupon rate and the equivalent rate on non-convertible debt. The issuance fees here are still going to be based on the 5 billion times the 1%. And so for the book value of the liability in this case, we record a number that is about a billion dollars lower than it would be under US GAAP. And then for the book value of the equity component, we take the dollar amount, the 5 billion here, and we subtract the value as a traditional bond. And so we get an equity component here of almost a billion dollars. The annual cash interest expense is actually the same. So we take the 5 billion and multiply by the 0.5% coupon rate. The amortization of the issuance fees is actually the same as well. So we can pretty much copy this formula across. I'll just anchor the maturity so we can do that. And then for the amortization of the bond discount, this actually gets complicated and there's more to it than just a simple straight line assumption in a lot of cases. But to simplify things a little bit, we can take the equity component right here and then just divide by the maturity of six years. And so what this means is that if we split up the bond into liability and equity components, we get a much higher interest expense here. And if you think about the numbers, almost $200 million in interest per year, and we divide by the 5 billion here, this gives us an interest rate that is around 4%, which is very close to the equivalent rate on non-convertible debt. And that's the whole point of splitting it up like this. In terms of the non-cash adjustments here, we have the amortization of the issuance fees and the bond discount. So there is a whole lot more going on with the split liability and equity treatment 
The good news is that under US GAAP, usually you only have to deal with companies following this very simple treatment, so that makes your life a whole lot easier. Now, in terms of conversions and maturities here, with the split liability treatment, it gets very tricky, but at a high level, you reclassify the liability and put it into equity if there is a conversion before maturity. So for example, if we take a look at more of a financial statement model here, and we look at this case where the company has debt, has a convertible bond, and this is using the split liability and equity treatment, the value keeps increasing on the balance sheet each year because of the amortization. And then when there is a conversion, the equity component of the convertible bond goes away, the debt goes away, and instead they're both reclassified into the rest of the company's equity on the balance sheet. Under US GAAP, it is similar, but there's just less going on because there is no equity component here. So you just reclassify the debt out and put it into equity instead. If there is a maturity, so the company has to repay the debt and there is no conversion, the cash on the asset side decreases and then the liability component on the other side decreases to match it. So that's a little bit about the treatment on the financial statements. Let's now go into the next topic and talk about convertible bond valuation. So the main idea here is that you have to split the bond into equity and liability components and value the liability component first. You can use the price function in Excel and for the discount rate, use the same coupon rate on an equivalent non-convertible bond. So let's go back down here and we can actually take the same formula that we had for the split liability and equity treatment and just copy and paste it down here. And this will be the present value of the bond component. And that's really all we have to do for this. We already have the setup in place. We already had the formula. So there's no need to do anything more complicated here. The next part, the present value of the conversion option is more complicated because unlike the accounting treatment, we're not just going to take the 5 billion and subtract the 4 billion to get this book value number. Instead, we're actually going to value it based on some market factors, and that makes this considerably more complex. To do this, we need to value the call options. So we're treating the conversion options associated with the bond as call options, and so we have to use the Black-Scholes formula to value them. Now, the Black-Scholes formula derivation and explanation get quite complicated, and we don't have time to go through it here. But at a high level, options are worth more when they are more likely to be in the money or exercisable, and you can create probability distributions to show how likely this is and what they're actually worth at different ranges. A higher volatility and a share price that is closer to the conversion price are going to make call options worth more. And so based on these ideas, we can use some rather complicated formulas to create probability distributions around the conversion price and the share price and to figure out the weighted value of each call option. You can see one of the key formulas here for a term called D1, which involves the natural log and a bunch of other terms. Once we have that, we can move from the value of each call option to the value per bond to the value across all bonds. And then ultimately we get to the implied value, which tells us what the convertible bonds market price should be after issuance. Let's just go in and take a look at this. As I said, I'm not going to go through all of this because it gets way too complicated to explain in a high level overview, but this D1 term depends on factors like the time to expiration, the risk-free rate, the stock price's volatility. This is a very volatile company with a 45% volatility. It also depends on things like the dividend yield. We can create normal distributions using the norms dist function in Excel. And we can have them for both the stock price itself and also for the exercise price or the conversion price here. We can put together these pieces and use this formula involving several exponents to calculate the value per call option. And then once we have this value per call option, we can actually look at the value of the conversion option on a per bond basis. So we can take this, we can multiply by the conversion ratio. And then if we want, we can also factor in some of the dilution here. So we can take this and divide by the overall dilution from these 16 or 17 million of dilutive shares. So this gives us the value of the conversion option on a single bond here, but we need to get it across all the bonds, which means that we need to multiply by the number of convertible bonds, the 5 million right up here. And then once we have that, we get to about 1.2 billion. This is the present value of the conversion option. You can see how it is quite a bit different from the 975 million that we got to right here. And then we can add these up and 
the implied value here is about 5.2 billion. You could see how the company issues it at this price of 5 billion, but according to our analysis, it should actually be worth more like 5.2 billion. So there is a small differential here. So that is at a high level, how you can value a convertible bond. Let's now go to the next point and talk about payoff diagrams and payback periods. Once you've valued a convertible bond, you can create a payoff diagram that shows the downside protection it gives to investors. The idea here is that you plot the convertible bond's value or market price, and then its value to investors over a wide range of different share prices. This is especially useful for a highly volatile company. The market price is just what you set up with the valuation, and then the value to investors is either the face value of the convertible bond if the share price is below the conversion price, or if the share price is above the conversion price, it's the value of the common shares that it can convert into at that level. So let's go to Excel and take a look at what a chart using this actually looks like. So I have a blank diagram over here. I have the share prices plotted going from 50 all the way up to almost $400 per share. For the value to investors, we can look at the stock price. And if this is less than the conversion price right here, then all it's worth to investors is the face value, the 5 billion right here. But if the stock price is above the conversion price, then we can take the potentially dilutive shares and multiply by the stock price that we have right here, the current one that we're looking at. So the $50 in this case, I'll anchor the K11 so this does not shift around. We can then copy this down so we get the value to investors and you can see that as soon as it crosses the conversion price, it becomes worth more than $5 billion because it can convert into common shares at that point. Now for the bond price itself, here we can just go and take the output of our formula right here, the implied value of the convertible bond, and then we can set up a quick sensitivity table. We can highlight everything. There will be no row input cell, but for the column input cell, we can go up and link to the current share price right there. And now we can see it reflected here. So this gives us a payoff diagram. You can see the payoff value in blue right down here, and then the bond price or the market value in red. There are a couple of key points looking at this diagram. The first is that even when the share price is below the conversion price, the convertible bond is worth more than its payoff value. So you can see here that even when the company's current share price is below $300 per share, the bond price or its market value is actually above its payoff value. And the reason this happens is because it offers downside protection and also the possibility of equity upside, unlike normal shares or bonds. It offers the best of both worlds, and that's why it's worth more than a traditional $5 billion bond would be. In terms of other metrics, there's also something called the payback period, which again, we don't really have time to get into in detail here, but essentially this one works by taking a look at the market conversion premium per share. So in other words, how much extra would investors pay to get shares of a company via a convertible bond instead of just buying the shares directly? And then we can look at this ratio. We can look at how much of a premium there is. We can look at how much extra income they would earn if they own the shares directly. And then based on these factors, we can look at the extra income per share and then the amount extra they're paying to get the convertible bond. And that gives us something called the premium payback period. It's 75 years in this case, which is incredibly long. The significance of this is that if this premium payback period is lower, the convertible bond is more like a traditional bond. If it's very high, it's closer to equity. In this case, this period is so high that no one would ever buy this because they want to be paid back. They buy it because they want hedged equity for a very risky, very volatile company. So those are a few other metrics and ratios you can look at here. And then the last topic I want to get into is the blended cost of convertible bonds. In the WAC calculation, the weighted average cost of capital calculation for the discount rate for normal companies, a lot of people will count convertible bonds as either debt or equity. And in fact, we do this in many case studies on our site and in our courses. For example, we could do a quick check and see that if the convertible bonds actually convert to shares, then we do not count them here as a part of debt in the equity value to enterprise value bridge. And we can do that type of check. And if there are no shares, so if the convertible bonds cannot convert into shares currently, then we do count them as debt right here. And that is a quick, simple way of dealing with it. There's nothing wrong with this method, but 
If you want to focus on convertible bonds or they're very important for a company you're analyzing, it's also not the most accurate method. The better method is to split the convertible bond into components, calculate the cost of each component, and then take the weighted average. The cost of the liability component is simple. It's just going to be based on the equivalent rate on non-convertible debt, but the cost of the conversion option here is considerably more complicated. It gets more complicated because the conversion option is actually more expensive than normal equity and it requires the inputs from the Black-Scholes formulas that I showed you briefly before. So the cost of the conversion option is the risk-free rate plus the equity risk premium times the option beta. Very similar to the cost of equity, but we're not using normal beta, we're looking at the beta on the option specifically. The option beta is equal to something called the option elasticity times the levered or the relevered beta from the comparable companies or for just this company's historical performance. And the option elasticity represents the percentage change in the option price for each 1% change in the stock price. And this has to be done over the entire convertible bond. The basic idea here is that the call options within the convertible bond are more sensitive to changes in the stock price than the common shares are. So the cost of the conversion option is higher than the cost of equity. This happens because if the stock price changes by $1, that's just a $1 change. But that $1 change is going to affect the price of the call option within the convertible bond by more than $1, so they're more sensitive. Let's go in and take a look at how this works. I have over here some output from our comparable public companies for this company. For the cost of equity, it's going to be the standard risk-free rate plus the levered beta times the equity risk premium. So the cost of equity is between nine and 10%, pretty standard for most companies. The option delta here is actually the same as the normal distribution around D1 that we had from the Black-Scholes setup right here. And then the option elasticity is equal to the option delta right here. And then we need to go up and do some additional math. So we will take the potentially dilutive shares right here, we'll multiply by the current share price, and then we will divide by the present value of the conversion option down here. So we're trying to figure out the percentage change in the options price for each 1% change in the underlying stock price. That's what the elasticity is telling us. And then for the option beta, we can just take the option elasticity and then we can multiply by the median levered beta. So we're essentially going from the levered beta on the stock to the levered beta on the option by multiplying by the elasticity right here. And we're doing this to illustrate how it is more sensitive than the underlying stock. We get the option beta like that. And then for the cost of the conversion option, we take the risk-free rate and then the equity risk premium. And now we multiply by the option beta rather than the normal beta. The cost of the conversion option is almost 15%. So about 50% more expensive than equity in this case. And then to calculate the blended cost, we can just go up and take the present value of the bond component and the equity component. For the cost of the debt component, it's just the 4% here, and we multiply by one minus the tax rate because the interest paid on debt is still tax deductible. And then we have our cost of conversion option right here. And then we can do a sum product to calculate this. So we'll take the market value and then the cost of each one, and then we'll divide by the total market value right here. And once you do that, you can then plot it and create diagrams, and you can see that what happens here is that as the company's stock price increases, the cost of the conversion option keeps going down, but the blended cost of the convertible bond keeps going up. It starts out being very close to the after-tax cost of debt right here, but then as the share price goes up, it gets closer and closer to the cost of equity. So in reality, if you want to be accurate, the cost of the convertible bond is always in between the cost of debt and the cost of equity, and it increases over time as the stock price increases and the convertible bond becomes more and more like equity. That's it for this lesson. Let's now do a quick recap and summary. We started off by giving you the typical terms and conversion options on convertible bonds. And I went through this very simple exercise up at the top of this Excel file, showing the conversion ratio, the number of convertible bonds and the potentially dilutive shares. Then we went through the types of companies that tend to issue convertible bonds, normally high risk speculative growth oriented companies that want to give investors some form of hedged equity. We went through convertible bonds on the financial statements and you saw the two main treatments, how you can record a convertible bond as a single liability or 
as a split liability and equity component, the rules around which one to use get complicated, but you just have to follow what companies choose to do in their statements. Then we went through convertible bond valuation and essentially the bond component is quite easy. You can use a simple price function. The conversion option component is more complicated. You have to get into some math around the Black-Scholes formula and value all the call options across the entire issuance to do this. Then we went through the payoff diagrams and payback periods. And I think the main point here is that because of the downside protection the convertible bond provides along with the potential equity upside, it's actually worth more than its payoff value even when the stock price is below the conversion price. And then we concluded with the blended cost of convertible bonds. The main thing here is that the conversion option is actually more expensive than standard equity for the company, but because of the way the math here works for most convertible bonds, the blended cost is always going to be in between the cost of debt, the after-tax cost of debt, and then the cost of equity over here. And you can see this very clearly if you look at diagrams involving all these variables. That's it. You could read entire books or textbooks about convertible bonds, but I wanted to give you more of an overview of the key points and teach you what is important and what to focus on if you only have, say, 30 minutes and you want to learn the basics of this topic.